Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. We're a little different order this morning. Uh, PJ's gone, and, and uh, we've got our normal piano players gone, and, and so we're, we're calling an audible, and we're worshiping the Lord with what we've got, and I'm very thankful for the people who are here serving today. Uh, as we pick up our story in Ephesians chapter 5, our walk, manner of life, continues to be our focus And I want you to consider with me before we read our text all that we've been told about this so far. Just a little bit of review to kind of bring us up to speed and get our minds wrapped around our subject matter this morning. All the way back in chapter 4 and verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Now that verse introduces this subject to us, that our walk... The way that we live is supposed to measure against what we believe. We are to live according to what we believe. Does that make sense? Are you all with me still? Secondly, in verse 17 in the same chapter, this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Now we start to make a distinction between the old life and the new. That our new self, which is recreated after righteousness and true holiness, after the likeness of God, is supposed to be different than the old self. We're not to walk that way anymore. Instead, we walk according to our faith. And then last week, chapter 5 and verse 1, we are to be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us. Our memory verse, right? We're to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, as I said, the emphasis in this whole entire diatribe, and that's exactly what it is, it's a body of teaching, has been on putting the old self away and putting on the new self. And that continues here in our text in verse 8, where we are told to walk as children of light. We continue to walk, continue to imitate God by doing the things that he did, by walking the way that he walked. In this case, we walk in the light. And so now's a good time to read our text. Look with me at verse 7 in Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore, do not become partakers with them. The them there points back up to verses 5 and 6. Those particular sins that are named in those verses. We are not to become partakers with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Before we go any further, can we pray and ask God to bless his word this morning? Father, I pray that your word would accomplish the very thing that you sent it to do today. Just like the rain that comes down from heaven, that waters the earth, that gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater, your word will not return void. And so I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bring us into a deeper knowledge of the truth, that it would transform us from the inside out, and that we would walk as children of light, because we are light in the Lord. We ask your will to be done this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So just so that we're on the same page this morning, when we're talking about light, we're not talking about the physical energy that illuminates sight and makes things visible. Uh, We are talking about the spiritual energy that does that, that illuminates us, that gives us sight, that makes things visible for us. And I want you to consider how this concept is taught throughout the whole of Scripture, In particular, in the Old Testament, Psalm 27 and verse 1 says that the Lord is my light and my salvation. We see it again in Isaiah 60 and 19. He, God, will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Psalm 119, 105 famously says, 
that the word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And Christ calls himself, John 8, 12, the light of the world. And John 1, 4, and 5 says that that light, the light of men, has come into the world and the darkness has not overcome it. So what exactly are we talking about when we are talking about walking in light? Are we talking about making sure that all the light switches are turned on? Or are we talking about walking in the truth? Or are we talking about walking in the spirit? Or are we talking about walking by faith? I can assure you that those spiritual matters are what's in play here. Because when you look at the, the Greco-Roman culture in which Ephesians, the, the, the people who would have read this letter first, read this letter, they had a particular concept about light, that there was a dualism in Greek culture, that light represented goodness, darkness represented evil. And that same dualism, by the way, appears in Jewish culture as well, although it may be a more intellectual idea that light references wisdom and knowledge, and darkness represents evil, sin, that kind of thing. John MacArthur explains in his commentary how this figurative use of light has two aspects. And I'd like to quote that for you because he says that that is both intellectual and moral. Intellectually, it represents the truth, whereas morally, it represents holiness. The figure of darkness has the same two aspects. Intellectually, it represents ignorance and falsehood, whereas morally, it indicates evil. Both figures pertain to what a person knows and believes and pertains to how he thinks and how he acts. And so once again, we are called here to live like the people we really are. When we are encouraged to walk as children of the light because we are light in the Lord, the scripture is encouraging us, even admonishing us, to live like the people we really are, to live according to what we believe. And so to live in light and to walk in light means that we walk in righteousness and true holiness after which we've been recreated in the image of God. That we walk according to what we have seen and heard in Jesus Christ. And our text frames this both positively and negatively this morning. And so let's, let's just take it apart. Positive first, negative second. There's three of each. Look back with me at verse 8. Where positively we are told walking in light is determined by our position in Christ. This is something that we're familiar with now. Because this, this entire body of teaching, we've tried to understand that this is something we do because of who we are. We're not doing it to try to achieve something. We're not doing this to try to be accepted. We're doing this because we are accepted. We're not doing this try to attain grace and mercy. We are doing this because we have received grace and mercy. It is who we are. And that's what verse 8 teaches. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Darkness is what we once were. It doesn't just describe what we did. It doesn't just describe who we once were. It is what we were. We were darkness. Now, empirically speaking, that means that we weren't just victims of the fall. And I realize that we all battle indwelling sin and that sometimes we kind of treat our place in the world like we are simply victims of the corruption of sin. And that's true, but it's not the whole truth because we are not just victims of the fall. We're not just falling prey to the schemes of the devil. We're not just receiving his fiery darts. We're not just victims here. We're not just deceived by the spirit of the age. We are. But you need to understand if, that if, if we were darkness, that, that we contributed to it. We participated in it. That's how we walked. It described our manner of life because... Darkness is what we once were. We were not merely in sin. But sin characterized our very nature. It's what we were. 
But you notice in the text, something very important is the tense of that verb. It is what we were. That condition does not exist any longer for those who are in Christ because light is what we are now. Light is what we are. We were darkness, but now we are light in the Lord. And that means something to us if we're paying attention. That means that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us under the kingdom of his beloved son, Colossians 1 and 13. That he, according to 1 Peter 2 and 9, has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We are not darkness anymore. It wasn't just that we were in darkness. That's what we were. We are now in the light. And we are the light in the Lord. Because this is present tense. And by the way, doing a little digging there into the Greek language, the, the language in which the New Testament was inspired and written, that is present tense, meaning that it's ongoing action. It describes a state of being with continued effect, that we are light because we are in the light. And because we are in Christ, then, we share in his nature. When Christ called himself the light of the world in John 8, 12, you need to remember what he said in Matthew 5, 14. What did he say there? You are the light of the world. He called us the light of the world, not just the church, but you. If you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit because of your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a light in the world. The church isn't just the city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. You are if you are in the Lord because you are light. You were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And so once again, we are simply called to live as the people we really are. We are called to walk in light because we are light. Amen? We are called to walk in light because we are no longer in darkness, but now we are in the light of the Lord. Look with me at verse 9, because the second aspect of this positively is that it will produce the fruit of the Spirit. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Now, I'm sure by now you realize that the metric for the Christian life, for our manner of life, for our faith, we have not tried to co-opt that from the spirit of the age. That when it comes to serving the Lord and walking according to what we believe, that we are not taking something that we find in the world and, and, and baptizing that and calling it success. That is not what we are doing. That's what legalism does by way of practice. We're going to check the boxes and do all the things so that we can be. That's, that's what we find in the world. That's not what we find here. This is who we are. Therefore, this is what we produce. Does that make sense? That we are producing it from a state of being. Just because we're not baptizing something that we find in the world and calling it godly or Christian doesn't mean that we're not known by what we produce. And Jesus said in John 16, or 7, 16, let me get it right, I'm sorry, Matthew 7, 16, we are known by our fruits. We're known by what we produce. And so verse 9 then provides some guidelines for that. That little parenthetical statement, you see how it's in parentheses in your, in your Bible? That that parenthetical statement is there to give us some guidelines about what we produce and what it should look like. Now, depending on what translation you have, there's some variations there. The King James calls it the fruit of the Spirit. The ESV, which I read earlier, calls it the fruit of light. The difference is irrelevant. And, I, and I'm not trying to diminish the Word of God in your mind at all, but you don't need to be troubled by the differences in translation there. The Spirit himself is our great illuminator of truth. That the Spirit himself is the one according to Jesus, who leads us and guides us into the truth. The Spirit himself is the one who takes what belongs to Christ and declares it to us. So we don't need to be troubled by the differences in translation. In fact, I think we're supposed to connect them. I think we're supposed to see that all that is righteous and good and true is connected with the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, and 23. 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. They're not different things. They are the same thing. And so as we walk in the light, we will produce the fruit of light, which also happens to be the fruit of the Spirit. Now those lists there, even in Galatians, this one here in our text, not exhaustive. They're samplings. They're simply meant as an example. And so when we look at all that is good, what are we talking about? There's a nobility here that is lost in translation, but we are literally talking about something that is excellent, that is honorable, that is morally upright. When we talk about that which is right, we are talking about integrity and character. The people that we are when we are by ourselves, when no one is looking, when no one is judging. That's what we are talking about here when we are talking about all that is right. And sooner or later, when we walk in the light because we are light, who we really are begins to come out. And, and there become, the difference between those two things becomes less and less and less as those circles begin to overlap and what we really believe and who we really are and how we live our lives become one in the Lord. All that is true speaks about honesty. Not honesty in reference to the truth, honesty in reference to humility and transparency, meaning that we're not putting on airs, that we're not trying to, to convince people that we are something that we're not. We're not behaving like the world when we're with the world, and, but like the church when we're with the church. We're not acting like the darkness when we're with the darkness. We're not acting like light when we're with the light. We are who we are, even when we make mistakes. And I think that's, that's the idea here when we're talking about honesty and transparency. Sometimes we're simply projecting something. Sometimes we're trying to cover something up and act like it's not there. The point being that we're honest, even about our mistakes, even about the difference between who we know we're supposed to be and where we are right now. That when we fail, we fail, and we humbly repent, we cover that with the grace and mercy through the blood of Jesus Christ, and we continue to walk by faith. Amen? That that's the idea here. And practicing these things then, practicing goodness and righteousness and trueness or honesty in this way is a means by which we walk in the light. That this is what we do because of who we are. We're not doing these things so that we can be in the light. We do these things because we are the light. Thirdly, Verse 10, walking the light is also pleasing to the Lord. And positively, you need to understand that this brings a smile to the Lord's face. And I say that a little tongue-in-cheek, but it fits. That, that we are pleasing the Lord when we live as the people he has remade us to be. Even though our sanctification process is not complete. Even though we have yet to be like him because we have yet to see him as he really is. We are still on this journey of sanctification, and as we progress, as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we walk in the light because we are light in the Lord, it makes Jesus happy. I, I want that, don't you? That, that I want him to be pleased with me. In the Christian life, then, I need you to understand this, and I know I keep beating this drum. But we are not talking about a means of earning. But that does not mean effort is not required. Does that make sense? That we're not trying to achieve or to earn status or position. We have that. But we are still putting forth effort to do what is required of us. That's where faith begins to work. I hope you understand that. And this effort that is required here is to try, you see that in the text, and discern what is pleasing to the Lord. I think the New Living Translation captures the meaning here 
in a most pleasant and applicable way. That we are to carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Maybe a better way of describing it rather than talking about effort is care. It should concern us what pleases the Lord. That, that our concern should be for pleasing the Lord. Another way to put that would be this. That we begin to find joy in what the Lord finds joy in. That as we walk in the light, what we delight in is what He delights in. And we learn that. That isn't learned by osmosis, it's learned by practice. It's not something that is just dumped in our laps, it's something that we learn by degrees. And as we walk in the light, we are learning, putting forth effort to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. We are learning to delight in what He delights in. I know that may leave a question mark hanging over you like, what does God expect of me and what does God want me to do and what is God's will for my life? You don't have to search very far to find that out because there's a sense in which the entire body of this teaching is pleasing to the Lord. Everything that is coming hereafter is going to be pleasing to the Lord. All that completes the teaching in the New Testament, the things that we have in seed form, embryonically that belong to Jesus, that are explained in further detail in the epistles of the New Testament, all of that is pleasing to the Lord. Do you want to know what God's will is for your life? Open up your Bible and begin to read. It doesn't matter where. I thought I'd get a witness on that. That it's not a mystery. That we're not trying to aim at a target And if we miss the bullseye, we've missed God's will. God's will is right here for us, black and white, on the page. And so when you want to know what pleases the Lord, open your Bible. Be quick to listen to the Holy Spirit. Learn to delight in what He delights in. But let me me push the pause button here for just a second. Because I want to remind you that the Holy Spirit is kind and he is gentle, just like your great high priest. And that you're not drinking from a fire hose here. It's not everything all at once. And I am so thankful for that. That it's the next right thing today. And guess what tomorrow will be? It will be the next right thing again. That God expects you to work where you're at, not where you think you ought to be. God expects you to do with what you have, not with something you're missing or something that you might have down the road. Start right now and do the next right thing today. And then tomorrow, his only expectation of you is that you do the next right thing. Not that you have everything figured out, Not that you have everything mapped out, but that you do the next right thing. That's what it means to walk in the light and to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. And so now we get to form this negatively. We've seen it positively. Now let's turn our attention back to the text and look at the negative side of this because there are some things as we leave the darkness behind, that we are also supposed to leave behind by way of practice. Negatively, in verse 7, in the beginning part of verse 11, we walk in the light by refusing an unequal yoke. Therefore, do not become partners with them. You see that in verse 7? The beginning part of verse 11, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. As children of light who have been transformed from darkness to light, out of the domain of darkness into the domain of Jesus Christ, that we cannot become partners, continue to remain partners with the ones named in verses 5 and 6. Now, we tend to, and I need your attention on this because this is important. The perspective on this is important because growing up, even till recently, I've always taken this to apply to our associations. 
this idea of separation. That light doesn't fellowship with darkness, and therefore we cannot become partners, so we have to separate and remove ourselves completely. And, and, and there's a sense in which that's true, but it really has more to do with your affections than it does with your associations. Allow me to explain. Your desires. To be partner literally means to be co holder. And, and it, the implication of that is to possess the same desires, the same goals, the same dreams. Not just your associations. That, 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 that's kind of low hanging fruit. We're talking about holding on to the same goals and the same desires and the same dreams that you had when you were in darkness. They're trying to maintain those and keep those now that you are in the light. But please remember, the new self is recreated after the likeness of God and righteousness and true holiness comes with new desires. So the intention here is that we don't want the same thing. Does that make sense? We don't want the same things that we used to want And we don't want the same things that the world wants. Does that make sense? And that's where a a distinction must begin to take place. Not that we isolate ourselves and we, we adopt all these monastic practices and go live in a cave somewhere. That's not the intention. The intention is we don't desire the same things. I don't desire the same things I used to. And I don't turn to the world to form my current desires And affections. That's what it means to co hold. Secondly, as children of light, we cannot take part in the unfruitful works of darkness. To take part literally means to co fellowship. And this is a word, when you read through the book of Acts, if you were to look at the Greek language, and I'm not really a Greek scholar, I have a computer program that is wonderful that helps me do this. I know just enough to be dangerous. But this word is used exclusively in the book of Acts for the fellowship of believers. It it, it refers to the assembling of believers. Beginning in Acts chapter 2, when they had all things together and in common. It's the same kind of word that is used there to describe the fellowship of believers in the New Testament. And so please help me as, as, we, as we work this out. As people who are in Christ then. As people who are now in light in the Lord. And not in darkness any longer. We seek community. That is closeness. To care for others and to be cared for. Understanding. That kind of relationship quality. We Seek that among our brothers and sisters in Christ. We do not go seeking it from the world. Does that make sense? That is how we apply walking in light here. That we are not looking for community. For for the kind of fellowship that we are supposed to have in the church, in the body of Christ, in the world. This concept, by the way, is explained quite nicely in 2 Corinthians 6 and 19, which I have always kind of heard and maybe misapplied. But let's read this together because I want to help you understand it as God has revealed it to me this week. 2 Corinthians 6, 19 says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? We just saw that word. Or what fellowship, same word here, take no part, has light with darkness. What accord has Christ with Belial? Belial is the devil, just in case you're wondering. Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. Now, right here, we have something empirically for us. We are the temple. The Holy Spirit lives in us. And so the metaphor we just got done talking about helps us work out what we're learning in Ephesians. That that we are to take no part. We're not to be partners with. 
That we can't have the same desires, the same goals, the same dreams. That we're not to seek fellowship and community because that's darkness and we don't belong there anymore. We are the temple. We find it in the light because that is who we are now. If we were to continue to read there in 2 Corinthians 6, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says, says the Lord. And touch no unclean thing and I will welcome you and I will be a father to you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since then, we have these promises. Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of the Lord. I'll say it again, just so that we understand that we are leaving behind our old affections because that's who we were when we were darkness. And we are embracing new ones because we are light in the Lord. That we are, we are letting go of all of those old hopes and dreams because that's what we had when we were in darkness. And we are embracing new ones because of who we are in Christ Jesus. And we separate from the world not in a way that diminishes our influence, that does not allow us to go and proclaim the gospel and invite people to live a life of discipleship with us. That would be isolated and, and it would be of no purpose. But we are seeking community and fulfillment and satisfaction and closeness and intimacy in the body of Christ amongst our brothers and sisters who are also light in the Lord. Because we have let go of the darkness. Because that's who we were. It's not who we are now. Are you tracking with me? Secondly, negatively, again, we walk in the light by renouncing the works of darkness. Not just refusing an unequal yoke. Verses 11 and 12. The second half of verse 11. That, that not only are we to have no fellowship to take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but you see there we're supposed to expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of those things that they do in secret. And so, practically speaking, instead of participating in, we should be exposing. Now, let's take a minute and let's drill down on that word that is translated as expose, because that means to reveal it means to make known. It's just kind of a nice little word play on light because that's exactly what light does, doesn't it? You flip the lights on and you can see. Some tend, because of the way this is translated in some, some various ways, insist that this word has a confrontational tone to it. That the idea of exposing means that we are supposed to confront evil we're supposed to, to call evil, evil, and call good, good. And, and that's the sense that it means to reprove, not just expose, that we're supposed to name it and call it out. And I, not, I don't necessarily think that's wrong, but, but to meet that with some kind of intolerance toward sin. It's not wrong. I just don't think it's in keeping with the rest of the text. Allow me to explain. Because when you read verse 12... That verse 12 says it's a shameful thing, a disgraceful thing to speak of the things that are done in secret. And so would it, work with me here, would it not be disgraceful and shameful to speak of those things that are done in secret in confrontation of them and naming them as shameful and disgraceful? Does that make sense? That if we were to call them out and name that, is that what we're supposed to do in order to bring everything into the light? I don't think so. I think the exposing agent here is the light, not us. The exposing agent here is not what we say in reproof of a world that is in darkness and in sin around us. The exposing agent is the light of the gospel as we live life. In a dark world. Paul told the Philippians that we, sh he said, we shine as lights in the midst of a dark and perverse generation. It's not you who does the exposing. It's the light within you 
that does the exposing. When we walk in light and we practice the fruit of light, I think it is our manner of life that exposes the darkness around us. It is the way we live in contrast to with the way the world lives that exposes the darkness. I think you see this in the Old Testament with Sabbath living. Please hear me out. I think one of the reasons coming out of Egypt, ransomed out of slavery, delivered from the house of bondage, God's expectation for his people was that they don't do no work on the Sabbath and that they would keep the Sabbath day holy was that was how they lived differently. Especially in the land. All of the commands given around the Sabbath were when you get to the land where you're going. When they take up residence in the land of Canaan. When they begin to, to live around the world that, that, that is cloaked in darkness. That living as, as, as the people of God. They took the seventh day off. Did no work. They rested because they're not God. They worshipped because God had provided for them everything that they needed. That was supposed to be a, a line in the sand. This is how we are living differently. And that that in and of itself, living as light like that, would expose the darkness of their deeds. Let me explain in another way. Light doesn't push back the darkness by pointing out that the darkness is dark. Please hear me on this. It pushes back the darkness by being light. Because by nature it is different. That's how it pushes back the darkness. And so in context then, I already mentioned the Sabbath. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14 gives us another example of what this looks like concerning suffering. Because light becomes apparent and the people of God begin to suffer. That this idea that somehow because you're a Christian, because you're in Christ, that difficulties no longer apply to you, that's kind of the expectation that the world places on you. And the enemy loves to use the fact that you suffer as a means to bombard your faith and erode your faith and tear down the commitments that you've made to the Lord. But listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter 3.14. And if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for you a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So in this context, the Roman context, when, when they're being persecuted for their faith and their property has been confiscated and they've been beaten and arrested and imprisoned because they would not confess Caesar as Lord because they only confessed Jesus as Lord and they, they suffered with a smile on their face, willingly accepting that as blessing the watching world looks at that and says, hold on a minute. This is supposed to make you bitter. Why aren't you bitter? This is supposed to make you angry. Why aren't you reviling me in return for me reviling you? Why aren't you insulting me because I insulted you? And when we bear that patiently with joy and receiving it as a blessing, we live differently as light in a dark world, and light by nature pushes back the darkness. We don't stand up in those circumstances and point our fingers and condemn that we live like the people we really are. And when we get bumped by suffering, the joy that is in us spills out of us rather than the bitterness that we find in the world. You want a good practical example of this? Look at Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail. They had been arrested and beaten and placed in the stocks in the innermost cell in the prison. And at midnight, what are they doing? They are singing. Singing. 
And the earthquake opens the prison doors. And I, I wish I had time to go into all this, but the jailer immediately thinks they've escaped and he's about to kill himself. And Paul says, time out, we're still here. And how does that man respond to the light in the midst of that darkness? What do I got to do to be a part of what you got? Right? How do I get what you have? What must I do to be saved? Because light pushes back the darkness by being light, not by condemning the darkness for being dark. Does that make sense? And so back to our point here, we walk in the light negatively by renouncing the works of darkness, and that is simply letting our light shine so that when people see our good works, they give glory to our Father who is in heaven. And then finally, verses 13 and 14, negatively, we walk in the light by revealing the truth. When anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. The phrase, anything that becomes visible is light, is better translated, I think, and you'll forgive me for bouncing around here, but the NIV captures it very, very well, that, that it is the light that makes everything visible. That's the essence of what is being said there. Light shows things as they really are. Sometimes that's not well received. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm almost 50 years old and I have a toddler in my house. And, and our toddler has decided that wake up time is about 4.30 in the morning. And he, I hear his door open and slam and his little feet patter across the kitchen. I hear our door open and the light comes on. Not all the time. But sometimes he flips the light on. I can assure you, that's not pleasant. It's not pleasant for me, and it's certainly not pleasant for him. Because Fawn will tell you, when I, when I am awakened out of a deep sleep, I have trouble controlling the volume of my voice. I get very loud and intense, don't I? It's not always pleasant when the light comes on and shows things as they really are. Sometimes because it's unpleasant and sometimes because it hurts, we try to reject the light as if the light's the problem. Jesus talked about this in John chapter 3. The light has come into the world, he said, and people love darkness rather than light because their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed, lest the truth of his deeds be revealed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in the Lord. Please understand that that can be very unpleasant, but it's necessary. And when the light comes on, when the Holy Spirit turns the light on, and, and what things actually are are revealed in truth, what do we do in that moment as children of the light? Do we reject the light because we don't like what we see, because it hurts, because it makes us uncomfortable? Or if we're filled with the Spirit who is turning on the light, do we yield in that moment and say, yes, Lord, I repent. This is not like it should be, and I know this needs to change. There's another aspect of this that is quite simple. Light doesn't just confront the darkness and push it back, light turns darkness to light. Light turns darkness to light. In other words, where there is light, darkness cannot exist because there is light. And, and I say all of that to say this is the mission of the church right here. The, the, the gospel is proclaimed so that people can be completely and totally transformed from darkness to light. The light is taking something that belongs to the dark and that is of the dark and not only making them part of the light, but making them light. Light takes the darkness and makes it light. And thus we have verse 14, this enigma of verse 14, which is literally a a call to repentance. Some commentators think that Paul has adapted this from Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1, 
that it's kind of a loose paraphrase quote of that verse from the Old Testament. Some New Testament scholars think that this was actually a hymn that was sung by the New Testament church on Easter Sunday of all Sundays. Whatever, it, I don't know if it matters, the Holy Spirit chose to inspire these words in Ephesians for us right now, right? And so, what do these words describe in verse 14? They describe somebody who is asleep, who is in the darkness of sin. And that this call to wake up, to arise, and to awaken is an appeal to repent, to come out of the darkness and into the light, to rise from death to life. That this picture of waking up isn't just a means of coming into the light, but also a means from leaving the death of darkness behind and embracing the light of light. And that's the good news, isn't it? Of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that if we wake up out of sleep, that if we repent, that Christ and his mercy and his grace will shine on us. That he will literally cover us with grace and mercy like the sun covers the earth with light every morning when the sun rises. That's the picture. Because even on a cloudy day, the sun still produces light in the midst of the clouds. And that's the idea here, that, that no matter how dark things are or no matter how dark they once were, Christ will transform that darkness into light in himself. And so the call then is to awake, O sleeper. Arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. If you feel like you're in darkness right now, if you feel like you're a part of the world that is sitting in darkness, a great light has been turned on. His name is Jesus Christ. He will shine upon you in grace and mercy if you will arise and but come to him. If you're like me and you've come to Christ in faith and you've come to him a thousand times since that day wanting more of him, more mercy, more grace, know this. At one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And so we need to walk as children of the light. We are called to live like the people we really are. May that be true for Christ's sake. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. Thank you that darkness is what we once were. Now we are light. Help us to walk as children of the light, as the people we really are in Christ. And that as we let our lights shine in the world, that the light itself would not only push back the darkness, but that would make the darkness light. That people would see our good works, the difference between us as light in the darkness, and they would give glory to you, Father. That they would believe the gospel and be saved. Holy Spirit, I pray even now that you would draw the person here that is sitting in darkness to the light. That you would draw them to faith in Jesus Christ. And that you would begin to quicken their conscience and awaken their spirit to their need for mercy and for grace. That you would give them the courage and the strength that they need to abandon their former life and cling only to Christ in faith. Your will be done, I pray. In Jesus' name. Let's stand.